Welcome back, goblins! You're listening to episode 13 of the Esoteric Book Club, the final episode of season 1. This show has grown quite a bit over the past year. Episodes have doubled in length, tripled for patrons. I added a second episode every month with the Esoteric News Briefs, and the overall reach has expanded to include iTunes and Spotify. This show is now consumed in 16 countries around the world, as well as four of you who come from unknown origins. I'm going to assume that the four of you are space aliens keeping tabs on me or something. Unsurprisingly, the top country for listeners is the United States, considering that I live here and all. But the number two spot took me by surprise. No, it's not Canada, who coincidentally took number three the second most prolific consumer of the Esoteric Book Club is South Africa. Yeah, that shocked me too. The most popular episode should come as no surprise. It was my interview with Jeremy McGowan on Esoteric News Briefs Episode 4. The next most popular are Episodes 1 and 2, which also makes sense. Most people want to check out a podcast from the beginning. After that, people seem to enjoy Urban Magic, followed by Werewolves and Dogmen. I'm rather happy with how the Werewolves and Dogmen episode turned out, so I'm glad to see that others felt positively about it too. That said, I feel like the Vengeful Jin episode will soon catch up in total number of listeners. I can't forget to thank my buddy Rachel over at the Life Mancy podcast, who inspired me to actually buckle down and get an episode recorded. I had been toying around with the idea for several years, but when COVID hit, and most of the businesses in West Virginia got shut down, I suddenly had free time to do it. Finally, I have to thank all of you, my listeners. Without you, I'd simply be streaming into the void. Or at least to those four weirdos out there in the cosmos. An extra special thanks goes out to my patrons, especially Samantha Shaver. Your contributions help supply me with reading material, pay server costs, and more importantly, keeping me full of coffee. But enough with the sentimental stuff. What are we talking about tonight? Are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? Have you or any of your family ever seen a spook, specter, or ghost? If the answer is yes, then don't wait another minute. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. That's right. Tonight, we are busting ghosts. Well, sort of. Specifically, we're taking a look at How to Clear Your Home of Ghosts and Spirits by Debbie Chestnut. Debbie Chestnut is a full-time author from Michigan. She has been doing paranormal investigations for over 20 years, but has been a psychic medium since childhood. This adds a unique layer to her investigations. Unfortunately, since this book was published in 2007, her personal website and the website for her investigative team, Black River Paranormal, have both gone offline. In her introduction, Debbie wants to differentiate between a ghost and a spirit. A ghost is an essence of a person that has passed away but has not yet moved on from the mortal world. A spirit is a ghost that has moved on and then returned to fulfill a task. It seems like a minor detail, but it does have a role to play in diagnosing what entity may or may not be inhabiting your home. Right away in chapter 1, Debbie poses the question, are you sure that it's a ghost? This is a massively important question to pose for investigators. There are so many things that could give you the creeps in a home, even a home that has been built more recently. The very first thing that she recommends everyone do is examine the wiring in the home. If you're not an electrician, hire one. Wiring issues could cause everything from lights flickering to appliances turning on and off. More than that, improperly insulated or grounded wiring can generate an electromagnetic field, also known as EMF. Do you remember in grade school science class when you had a powerful magnet and a vial full of iron filings? You'd pour the filings on the desk around the magnet, and they would align to the poles but they would also arrange themselves in a hemisphere around the magnet, going from pole to pole. That is a magnetic field. 
electronics can generate a field similar to that, only when it's in conjunction with other electronics doing the same thing, the field builds upon itself. This field probably won't have your watch sticking to the refrigerator, but it can cause some issues with the wiring in our brains. High EMF can cause paranoia, a tingling sensation similar to being touched, and in extreme cases, hallucinations. In one instance, Debbie was called upon to investigate a home that was being blessed repeatedly by a priest to no avail. That sent up warning flags for Chestnut, but before she panicked, thinking that there was a powerful entity in the house, she went through the basics and first checked the wiring. It turns out that none of the wiring in the home was properly grounded. While it wouldn't affect casual visitors, living in this home was like being surrounded by an invisible cage of fear and paranoia. Once the home was properly grounded, the priest was no longer needed. After you check wiring, you have to look for structural issues, such as drafts that could otherwise cause cold spots in the home, expanding and contracting door frames that would cause a door to open on its own, or possibly loose pipes that would vibrate or bang against floor joists, simulating footsteps. The primary question that people tend to forget, as well as get defensive about, is animals. Animals are weird. We are largely isolated from their daily existence, so we don't get to hear the noises they make when they're laying down to sleep, when they're playing, when they're fighting, or when they're simply scratching at the walls. In one case, a family was hearing scratching sounds that seemed to come from within the walls. They had attempted to locate the source, but they could not narrow down which wall it was coming from. It almost seemed as if the sound was forming out of thin air. When Debbie was there to investigate, she looked around the room and finally asked if there was access to the roof. The homeowners were a bit confused, but they led her to a window that gave her access to the roof above the living room where the sound was coming from. With her flashlight, Debbie looked into the chimney to find a whole family of raccoons had managed to climb in, but could not climb back out. The scratching sound was echoing down the chimney and reverberating through the walls. How did she know to check for that specific scenario? The exact same thing happened to her in her own home. Speaking of scenarios that happened in her own home, Debbie debunked her own shadow person sighting. At a certain time of day, her neighbor's porch light would come through Debbie's window at just the right angle to backlight her cat as he chased insects in the window. This caused a shadow to form in the reflection of her computer monitor as she was writing. Of course, as soon as she turned around to catch the shadow person, her cat would freeze and there would be nothing to see. The final thing to consider, though it's not as prevalent as it used to be, is to check on remote devices. Sometimes, unrelated devices can be set to transmit on the same radio frequency. For example, at one point, Debbie figured out that her neighbor's garage door opener was activating her remote-controlled ceiling fan. It was confusing at first, but she eventually noticed that it seemed to turn on at the same time of day, just when her neighbor was pulling into their driveway. Now that you've eliminated most mundane explanations, it's time to consider the paranormal. If you do indeed have a ghost, do you really need to get rid of it? It really depends on what type of ghost you have in the home, which also determines how you're going to expel it, too. Modern media makes us think that all ghosts are frightening and need to be removed as soon as possible, but in reality, that may not be the case. One type of haunting that Debbie sees frequently is what she calls a benign ghost, which is most commonly referred to as a residual haunting. These entities don't seem to even notice that there are other people in the house. They just continue doing mundane tasks, such as walking down a flight of stairs, without even noticing or interacting with the homeowners. If you have a residual haunt, there's not much you can do about it. But, on the plus side, they're typically harmless. Sometimes, you have what's called an anniversary ghost that shows up on a particular date performs a specific task, 
and then will vanish for another year. Oftentimes, these spirits are in some way associated with the family, or they are just making their presence known at a significant time. Finally, you have apparitions. These ghostly figures come in four flavors. Partial, visible, invisible, and solid. A partial apparition would not contain all of the parts that we would normally associate with a human being. They may not seem to have any legs, yet they walk around in the middle of the room. They may not have a head, or even more bizarrely, they may only have a head. It really depends on the scenario. Visible apparitions are those that can be seen with the naked eye, while invisible apparitions only seem to show up on recording devices or film. Finally, solid apparitions look just like a normal human being. They may be dressed in clothing that is slightly out of date, but otherwise, they look just like you and me. That is, until they vanish. Active hauntings, where the ghost seems to be aware of their surroundings, have a variety of manifestations, usually with a singular purpose. Avenging ghosts have a vendetta against a living person whom they typically blame for their demise. They are destructive and can often be confused with demons based on the amount of chaos they generate. Ghosts of children are as varied as the disposition of living children. You never really know what their temperament is going to be until you interact with them. Some want to play, while others are attention-seeking. Poltergeists have no attachment to or regard for their surroundings. They thrive on havoc. Despite their name meaning noisy ghost, it is widely speculated in the paranormal community that they are really manifestations of psychic energy, generated usually by teenagers. Think of it like a garden hose that has a small hole in it. It may seem fine until you pressurize it. Suddenly, it's spraying water in another direction. The teenager may be focused on something else, but when they're placed under stress, that focus shoots off in unintended directions, knocking pictures off the wall or flinging books across the room, for example. There are a few other types of ghost hauntings, but they are largely situational, such as an apparition that appears during the home renovations or graveyard ghosts. There are, however, other entities that may appear to be ghosts. Light beings are not usually seen with the naked eye, but they appear on recording devices as figures made of light. Investigators speculate that these are extraplanar beings that may or may not be otherwise aware of us. Orbs are 80% of the time just dust. A real orb will be self-illuminating and will move with intent and intelligence. They often appear to be spherical and can manifest in a variety of colors. Portals aren't specifically an entity, but they are areas where it's easier for entities to enter our world. This is still largely theoretical, but it also seems as if portals don't adhere to the laws of physics, specifically linear time. Shadow people are exactly what they sound like. They're humanoid figures that seem to be made of shadow. They are often distorted in appearance and don't like to be seen. Witnesses frequently describe them as being blacker than black, suggesting that rather than being made of dark coloration, they are instead an absence of light. While they seem ominous, they are largely non-threatening. Elementals are nature spirits given form. Think of dryads from Greek mythology or fairies from Irish lore. They are usually semi-humanoid, but also in some way alien in appearance. Alien as in otherworldly, not off-planet aliens. So these are just a few of the most common entities that you'll run into in the case of an actual haunting. There are some more extreme examples, such as demons, spiritual parasites, and even guardian angels, which can be terrifying in their own right simply for their single-mindedness. These entities will require the assistance of a professional to deal with, 
Amateur attempts to be rid of them could make things worse for those affected. Now that you know what to look for, it's time for the actual investigation. This isn't going to be like what you see on TV. You can't just go into a home a single night, run around with night vision cameras yelling at the dark. The first thing you need to do is to get into the habit of keeping a journal. The more information and the more detail that you can gather will help you identify exactly what you are dealing with. Remember the example of the garage door opener earlier? Had Debbie not been keeping a log of what time of day things got crazy, she wouldn't have figured out that it was related to the neighbor returning home. With your compilation of notes, you can start dissecting the haunting. Is the same thing happening over and over again? Chances are, it's a residual haunt. Is something communicating with members of the household? It's probably an intelligent haunt of some sort. Once you get it talking, you can figure out whether it's benign, benevolent, or malevolent, and then you deal with it accordingly. If the activity seems to be fixed on a single person, chances are that it's an attachment, or possibly a poltergeist. If it's the rare instance where it's all of the above, but turned up to 11 out of 10 on the spooky scale, that may be something a bit more powerful than you should handle, so seek out a professional. Now we can get into the main subject of the book, the actual cleansing. I have good news for you. Half of the time, this may already be done by the time you reach this step. You may have eliminated activity by identifying architectural problems. Recording and logging interactions may have helped you realize that it's a residual haunt, in which case there isn't much you can do. In situations where it's an intelligent haunt, sometimes just talking to the spirit may be enough to help them move on. Sometimes they don't even realize they're dead, or they're afraid of what awaits them on the other side. Either way, getting them to accept their fate will oftentimes help. If the ghost is tied to the home, sometimes just making them feel seen is enough. Could you imagine living with a strange family that otherwise ignores you? Sometimes, though, you have to get tough. Before you jump in and start waving smudge sticks and invoking the names of various elder gods, you should probably first be sure that you yourself are protected. The last thing you want to do is drive the spirit out of a home only to have it come back to your house. Preparation is key. Are you in the right headspace for this task? Are you perhaps a bit jumpy right now? Are you able to control your emotions enough that you won't be feeding into this ghost's own energy? Do you have backup? All of these are important questions when preparing for a ghost hunt. Debbie recommends a few things to prepare yourself. The first, and easiest, is humor. Yeah, humor, laughter, joviality. It's hard to be scared of something when you're laughing your ass off. Oftentimes, these things are trying to scare you. And that is incredibly hard to do if you find the entire situation hilarious. This doesn't mean that you have to be cackling the entire time, but a self-assured smirk wouldn't hurt. Meditation is another way that she recommends that you prepare. A clear mind will go a long way in easing your nerves. Granted, this will take a constant practice of meditation to make this an effective tactic. It doesn't do any good if you have to sit in silence for several hours before cleansing. Practice makes perfect, so a routine of meditation will have you in the proper mental state in no time. Debbie also suggests a mixture that she uses for herself. A scrub made from rosemary, sage, and sea salt. All of these ingredients have been traditionally used to ward off negative energies and to cleanse a person of anything that may be lingering on them. I'll let you get the details for this process from the book itself. There are a few other techniques that she suggests, including a white light visualization exercise, prayer, invocation of the angel Michael, as well as a few amulets that may help. Now that you're prepared, let's get cleansing. Literally. Some entities thrive in cluttered environments. Think of it as a physical manifestation of chaos. There is a reason feng shui is such a big thing. Clean the home, eliminate shadowy areas, and open the windows. 
Now that you have a clean space to work with and the windows open, let's start going from room to room and taking care of any lingering energies. What can you use? The answer that is probably at the forefront of everybody's mind is sage, and yes, you can use that. But that's not the only option. Holy water is probably the next thing to pop into your mind, and again, yes, you can use that too. Heck, there's nothing to say that you can't use them both together. Alternatively, you can use other herbs, some you wouldn't even need to burn. Although, you totally can if you're just a little bit of a firebug. St. John's wort was traditionally hung in homes for protection in Europe. Anybody with an Italian heritage may know about the protective power of garlic. It's not just for vampires. Have you heard the old adage about throwing salt over your left shoulder? That's because it was originally believed that the devil was leaning over your left shoulder and whispering in your ear, so you throw a little bit in his eye. If you want to get creative, you can dissolve some salt in warm water and add it to a spray bottle and then use that to mist a room. This serves a double purpose since the water also will help remove static electricity which could be utilized by the entities. Maybe smudge sticks and spray bottles aren't your thing. Have you considered other options, such as rice or sand? Apparently, particular spirits have OCD, which compels them to count every grain of whatever item you throw on the ground. This usually can keep them distracted until the sun rises, at which time the dawn will cause them to dissipate. Then you just sweep up the debris and toss it out with the trash. Hopefully, one of these techniques, or some of the others Debbie mentions in the book, will eliminate the entities. Now you need to maintain the space. This is the final chapter of the book, and ultimately, it's the subject for a whole other title. Long story short, it involves salt, candles, incense, and a few crystals. But I'll let you discover that one on your own. I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised with this book. I typically don't have a high opinion of metaphysical how-to books. Usually, they're very limited in content, and serve as an introduction to the subject more than anything else. This book, however, is a concise summary of the phenomena. Debbie has some personal anecdotes throughout, but unlike other titles, each of her stories has a point and adds poignant information that is pertinent to the section. The writing style is succinct, and there is very little jargon that isn't clearly defined. I feel that a person who reads this book should feel confident enough to diagnose their own situation and to take steps to remedy it. In the rare case where the techniques in this book won't work, you need a professional. On the plus side, after reading How to Clear Your Home of Ghosts and Spirits, you'll know what type of professional you'll need. Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and at esotericbookclub.org. If you enjoyed this episode, Please like, share, and leave me a message. But more importantly, tell somebody else about the show. Please consider joining my Patreon, where you can get access to articles, voting on future topics, and other tiered rewards. Even those who donate just $1 contribute to the most essential part, helping to keep me caffeinated. Intro and outro music is courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. Their music can be found at bandcamp.com and at wearehellojune.com. A link to How to Clear Your Home of Ghosts and Spirits by Debbie Chestnut is in the show notes, so you can grab yourself a copy. That's all I have for tonight. So until next season, remember, stay weird. I was done, didn't you? No, it's time for you extra special weirdos. This episode, you get to hear about the ghost in the mirror.